Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Freshly Pressed. Uh, today we have we have an, uh, we have a returning guest, Richard Fairgrave, with a new book of his, uh, "Ex Wives of Frankenstein." Welcome back on the show, Richard. Good to be here. I'm very. I got to say, As I'm you... very proud of myself because last time I was on your show, I completely screwed up the time, and so this time I I did screw up the time again, but early on, and it was corrected in time for me to be here on time today. So like, I, I think like next time I, it's just going to be like flawless or like too good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, despite everything, uh, it has been flawless. So it's okay. <laughs> Listen, I give great interviews. It's okay if I fuck up everything else. <laughs> you make great comics as well. So it's, it's all, all forgiven. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 like, I, I think everyone has seen that you've worked really hard on this, uh, on this book, especially like the whole, uh, whole process of uh, making that cover, oh, of paper mache, and you know, like that, that whole thing. That it, it's, it's amazing. And of course, you know, I did that at a point where I was, I was so far, like, I was so pressed against deadlines already. I had a cover <laughs> for this book that was finished, and I looked at it, and I was like. But what if I made a sculpture for the first time in two decades? Like, I literally have done nothing but draw and digitally yeah. color or, like, like occasionally do, like, ink wash stuff. But for two decades, I have not made a physical object beyond, like, flat paper with lines on it. And I was yeah. like, hey, uh, I'm going to not leave my office for the next two weeks just to get this thing finished. What if I add in making a big sculpture that involves me having to, like repeatedly like i had to remember how to do paper mache it, it was <laughs> i mean like the results are great i'm really happy with this cover and like the covers for issues two three and four which people haven't seen yet like are so fucking yeah. sick but yeah what was I don't, I don't know why i do this to myself i think i just get bored easily yeah i mean that's that's definitely not to the detriment of the book quite the opposite actually it has it has um uh bolstered the campaign pretty well so yes. i guess it's it's for the good anyway yeah and, and look it was worthwhile and like now i have these giant ass sculptures all around my office <laughs> <laughs> the, like i made the decision to, i'm doing i'm doing a new book at the moment called uh the lights that guide you home which will be coming yeah. out next year and mm -hmm. i came up with a concept for the cover today and i want it to kind of have like a, a stop motion or claymation animation feel to it Nice. Um, and I was like, well, okay. So I could, I could make the figure and like, it's a hand-drawn book with some collage and watercolor through it. I was like, well, I can make the figure and it's about, uh, when the street lights get changed from those beautiful old orange ones to like those horrible new white ones. And yes, it makes things technically brighter, but the shadows get darker and the shadows become yeah. so dark things start growing out of them. So I was like, so I have to make the things that are growing out of the shadows. So it'll be this like complicated mess of like weeds growing out of shadows that I'll have to make myself and I want to have like some actual light up pieces so I'll have to learn how to wire it which I don't know how to do yet but then because I've got to do a Kickstarter video for it what I should probably also do is actually do full stop motion of the cover like assembling itself as the video um so I, I don't know we'll like that might be a bridge too far for me but we'll see I but let's talk about this book I'm sorry I'm, I, I always get ahead of myself no, that's all right. That's all right. It's always it, it's always good to to think about like talk about your future work as well. You mm -hmm. know, uh, we we can always uh, reference this video when that comes. <laughs> yes, well, look, we'll 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 go in circles. You know how I spiral, but like you know, this book's not funded yet, so let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what 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 uh, what was the genesis of the of the idea of this book? Um. So. Like the basic premise is uh, it's a modern reimagining of the Frankenstein mythology. Um, it is Elizabeth Frankenstein and the Bride of the Monster 
on the day they find out that their husbands are alive and have been living as a gay couple in the Arctic Circle and are returning to the city as heroes of the MRA movement, online queer communities, and Reddit. Yep. Um, it is, I'm, like, playing a lot with, you know, like, I I love Frankenstein. It's, it's like, one of my faves. Um, I've always, you know, enjoyed a, a lumbering weirdo monster. Um, mm. But, uh, man, the, the, the women in the movies, they, yeah. they don't get a lot, you know? No. And, uh, I had been kind of like, I, I always like to like sort of rethink these things. I did a book years ago uh, with my buddy Theo called the son of Frankenstein. And it was about mm -hmm. Victor Frankenstein's dad being concerned that his son just had no motivation. Um, and, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to take over the family business, which was a beer and sausages restaurant called Frank's and Stein's. And like asshole customers would stand outside and say, you know, Frankenstein's is actually the name of the chef, not the restaurant, which is like my most, the most annoying thing to me about when people talk about Frankenstein, like it's the man, not the monster. It's actually both. Yeah. The monster is a reflection of the man. Like it's very clear in the, in the text. Like this is yeah. quite an important part of it. They lock arms, hold each other in an embrace and fall into the icy waters at the end. Um, yeah. Like they are, they are connected. They are one. They are both Frankenstein. Yeah. Also, they say it's not the monster; it's the doctor. Um, he didn't finish med school. He was busy digging up fucking corpses. So, yeah. Yeah. no, it's yeah, my, it's the last name of the guy who may or may not be a doctor. I guess it was yeah. easier back then to become a doctor. Like you just kind of like study a bunch of philosophy and say things, uh, yeah. and then cut people up a bit. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that humans survived. But so I've always like kind of, I, I like fucking around with, with like the, whenever a, um, whenever a piece, like whenever a text like enters the canon, uh, there's this period afterwards where people start um, using shorthand to show how clever they are for understanding it. Yeah, and yeah. it's always infuriating because it's always like the, oh, you, you just haven't read this or like, oh, you saw a movie or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and Frankenstein's kind of the like the ultimate one for it because people like to to talk about it in clever ways, but just kind of miss some points. And um, you know, there's there's obviously there's Son of Frankenstein and Ghost of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, all of these like the 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 blank of Frankenstein. And yeah. I thought, well, well, hang on, like, what about these women? What who are like? Let's let's reimagine that they've been that they are survivors of the story, um, yeah. and and let's just say like fuck it. It's the ex-wives of Frankenstein. Um, yeah. I knew I wanted to have the character uh, Victor and the monster be gay because uh, when I was, uh, when I was in college, I got into an argument with a, a college professor because I argued that Frankenstein is an inherently gay text. Um, the monster and Victor are desperately in love with each other. They, their, their love knows no limits of time or space. Yeah. They are connected forever and always. Uh, and, at the time, uh, most of my friends were all dating people who looked a lot like them. Um, and and uh, so that sort of just seemed like a normal thing to do. So I was like, yeah, so he kind of, much like God made man in his own image, you know, mm -hmm. um, like Victor made the monster in his own image. Uh, he created a, a, a fuck doll who wouldn't say no to him. Um, and I said, like, this is an inherently gay thing. And, and my professor said to me, Richard, that's not homosexuality. That's just narcissism. And I was like... <laughs> You know, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. <laughs> but, like, I wanted to kind of explore that in this as well. Like, uh, Elizabeth actually says that in issue two. Um, she's like, he, he, you know, he like, uh, fine, maybe he's gay. I don't know. But, like, he definitely made that monster to represent yeah. him. That's all it fucking yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and I, I like I like messy stories. I like I like, like, complicated characters who are good and bad, who say shitty things, who behave sloppily in messy situations and are just like still trying to be their best yeah and I, I think those are the most interesting characters as well like uh, i i don't read a book to to just just read about a plain old boring character you know like mm -hmm. it, it, i i if anything of interest has to be messy sloppy and has to make some sort of bad decisions to, exactly. to make the proceedings interesting so yeah makes sense <laughs> Yes. So, um, so I, I made the first issue, uh, I started this whole thing in like June, I think. Okay. Um, and, uh, I was like, look, I, I've been sitting on so many comics for so many years, um, during the pandemic and everything. And I was getting a little like, um, you know, Octopus was two and a half years old when I, um, when I, when I 
kickstarted it and then haunted hill is a year and a half old and i was like the next thing i have to put out was done in 2021 i want to talk about something that's like fresh in my mind am i getting feedback on the mic is that me no no it's it's fine okay i thought okay um just making sure i'm not fucking up your recording um because again i'm going to be perfect um (laughs) so uh like i was like I'm just gonna I'm gonna make this and I'm gonna put it out right away. I'll push the other stuff back a little bit because I I wanna I wanna be like in the moment of it and working on it at the same time so that I can feel like I'm like obsessed with these. You know I talk a lot about like obsession and the best writing comes from when you're a hundred percent in the world. Um, yeah. And so you know here I am. Uh, I, I ended up finishing it earlier than I thought I would, and now I'm on another book. So it still didn't work, but I'm I'm closer to it. I can remember yeah. every detail of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So, how how far along is you have you have you planned the arc already? Have you like um, written the whole I've, thing? I've I've finished the first arc. It's four issues. Okay. Um, that like there's a, my my initial intention with this was to write it as a a one off like a, a four issue arc. That's it. Uh, just cover their their day together as like their lives are thrown thrown into this new chaos. Um. And, you know, these things are always open-ended, but uh, I, I, I didn't have a plan in place for what would happen afterwards. You know, I don't want to write a sitcom. Um, yeah. I want to write a, a story that just, like, a, a character study, essentially. Um, but now, you know, I've fallen in love with them a little bit. I have some ideas for what the next story arc would be. I think it's really interesting that, like, because they're not dead like they now they're they're technically not divorced so now like victor and the monster are going to be wanting official divorces from these two i think yeah. that dynamic is fun um yeah and but then it becomes the strange balancing act of like i i don't i don't have uh victor or the monster in the story at all this is this is this is the story of the women um yeah and i i don't think i could keep that going forever but i can certainly keep going for as long as possible um, and find ways for it to be about like how each of them are going to behave to survive this new this this yeah. new normal. There is also I, I don't know uh, if that was intended or not, but when I read the book, there was an undeniable sexual tension between the two women as well. And <laughs> I, I don't know if, if you if you intended to do that it, or not, but I it it felt like, like some of the dialogue that there was. There some is. Undercurrent. I look. I don't. I don't. Th- I don't think I intended it. Um, <laughs> okay. I think that like these these women are. Um, they're connected by something that is inherently sexualized. Like, uh, the 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 thing that the thing that comes between them is that the bride who goes by victoria now uh victoria um is she's she's recently created you know she was built from body parts to be a gift for a man and she really thinks that like elizabeth couldn't possibly understand what that's like but in the novel and I, i i don't ever really address this in the text but like this is the motivation behind elizabeth in the novel elizabeth is introduced in uh, in Victor's retelling of it, that when he was five years old, his mother adopted a very pretty girl because she said a pretty girl shouldn't be being raised by a poor family and gifted this child to five-year-old Victor and said, this is your new sister, Elizabeth. She is here for your every pleasure. So while the bride was created for a man, Elizabeth has lived her life, it, like was raised to believe that she was a gift for this you know, genius weirdo yeah. who was off digging up bodies. Um, and so all of the resentment that Victoria has for Elizabeth, because, you know, Elizabeth has the family money and she has the nice apartment and she has the, mm. the, the better, easier life. And she doesn't have to go through the world being green and covered in stitches. She can have anonymity to some extent mm. and no one has ever called her a monster. Um, but a lot of this resentment is like that Victoria thinks Elizabeth couldn't possibly understand what she's going through. And Elizabeth is quietly thinking, I absolutely understand that part of it. I'm not going yeah. to bother telling it to you because you are a child. You are a new thing. And you, by all accounts, until I found out today that my husband is gay, 
I really thought you were him building his ideal other woman. Mm, mm. So yeah. like, yeah, the, the tension between them is, is linked to, to sex, but it's not it, like, and linked to like their physical bodies yeah. being objects made for others or gifted to others. But it, I, I didn't intend it to be a, a tension between them. What I, what I was hoping for was, um, this desire to for a, this a desire for a connection um yeah. you know you they know no one else can know what they're going through no one else could understand yeah. they don't like each other but they wish they did yeah and i think they in, in at least in this issue this issue they reach a point where they're like in their it feels like in their mind this this there, there was some sort of finality to the whole proceedings they, this was something that they already like they they had already come to terms with. Mm. Uh, they were moving they on. Yeah, yeah, they were already doing that. So, yeah. Like the monster and Victor went on a fucking rampage through the city. A bunch <laughs> of people got killed. Some buildings got blown up. They disappeared in a ship. Went to the Arctic. Chased each other around there and fell into the cold water and have been presumed dead. It's been three years, yeah. and now these two are suddenly finding out. Oh fuck! That tense peace we had is gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I I, I love how. Uh, oh, I, I should not spoil that cameo. <laughs> the, the little cameo in that in that dialogue uh, of the great uh, the great men's champion. <laughs> that should always be a surprise. It was it was funny as hell. <laughs> I, like I spent so long debating whether to put that joke in, and yeah, we won't spoil it. But like, yeah. You know, I wanted to really establish, like, this is a modern day story. This is set, um, I guess, like, I, I, I think at the time I was thinking this is like a pre-COVID story just because, like, they're out living in the world. Um, and then I'm like, oh, wait, everyone's just out living in the world. It, it can be now. Like, yeah. maybe Victor and the monster missed COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They were looking not so. That's not, yeah. Um, there's... There's actually, there are two minor cameos in the book, because there's, uh, on page one, you see the self-help book that, uh, oh. the, the, the text is for that, is by H. Clerval, which is uh, right. Henry Clerval, Victor Frankenstein's best friend. Uh, and he, he will actually feature um, as a, like, it's one of these strange things where, like, he, he never really features in the films, like, or not in any kind of interesting way. And I think that the way he's written about in the in the novel um, I always, I always like people think of Victor Frankenstein as this like heroic, you know, big, 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 cool dude who's out there like fighting monsters, yeah. whatever. And I think he's this like weird little simp. Like, I think he sucks. <laughs> I think he's a baby. Um, yeah. like the whole story is always told from his perspective. And it's always like, I went and talked to all these people and told them how smart I was. And they were actually like, no, you're not that smart. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> weird. So then I decided to prove that I was smart by making a whole person. And I dug it all up. And then when I brought it to life using lightning and stuff, he scared me. So I got real sick and he ran away. And I was like, I guess it's fine. Then he killed my brother. And I was pretty sad about that. Like, he's such a whiny little, like, he doesn't yeah. do anything. He doesn't fix yeah. any of his problems. And meanwhile, when he goes away to study, he says, Henry, I'm going to leave my uh, adopted sister slash girlfriend uh, here while I go to dig up some bodies and shit. Can you keep an eye on her? And Henry's like, yeah, totes. Like, I'm in there. And, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't think Victor knows that Henry and Elizabeth were definitely, like, just going yeah. to fuck town day in, day yeah. out. Like, they were rearranging each other's guts on the nightly. And, and Victor was just like, I'm in med school digging up corpses. I'm a cool boy. Um, and I, so I, I really want to have him as like this um, sort of, he's a, he's a, he's a background fixture of the story. You know, Elizabeth is always sort of casually defending him. Uh, he has written a fucking book called pulling that thread, um, like discovering your inner self. I can't remember the title, but like, he's clearly turned there because he just desperately wanted to be a Frankenstein, you know? Um, mm -hmm. he has turned their experience, their lived experience into a fucking self-help book. And he's doing very well because of it. Uh, yeah. I think like this dude sucks and Elizabeth defends him constantly throughout the story for yeah. reasons that are, you know, apparent from what I've just said, I guess. That is hilarious. 
the but, but, but like but you you said you're getting removed from the world you still knee deep in the world right in in the world of this book you still have three issues to go well i i finished them oh you finished them already yeah i i i made all four um i wanted um for the i i think this book is like is such a specific tone has such a specific tone to it um, before I started getting like reaching out to artists for variant covers and things, I wanted to have the whole story done so that I could say like, um, here, read the whole thing, because if you want to do a cover for issue one, awesome. But if, if there's something that speaks to you in a later issue, by all means, like make that the one you do, because I'm just, I'm, I'm reaching out to artists that I love the work of. Um, and so it's been really cool. And like, I've got, um, oh, fuck it. I'll say it publicly. Like, like, <laughs> I have like I have a Jill Thompson cover coming up. Ooh, it's nice. not for issue one, but like it's a fucking beautiful watercolor that she's done of this thing. Um, nice. I've got uh, my favorite Australian artist, Hey Weirdo, has done a cover for issue two, um, which is going wow. to be a set. It's it's you know those. Do you remember those like paper dolls where you could like the had like the character and then it had all of the pieces of clothing with little tabs and you'd fold them over to dress them up. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then, like, in the 2000s, they started releasing these with, like, TV Hits magazine. But they'd be, like, fridge magnet sets. And be like, hey, dress up Buffy. Yeah. I've done a dress up Victoria where it's her naked body in pieces that you can put together and then put all of the clothing over top of it. And it's it, that, that that is the cover. It's so fucking cool. So that's, that's the cover amazing. is the magnet sheet. But I'm going to release it as an actual magnet sheet as well so you can really do it. That's so cool. You always have some really fun rewards uh, as a part of your campaign, right? Like, I think last time you did, uh, you did that uh, message in the bottle thing. Oh, I, yeah, uh, I did the fake bottle of poppers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have anything weird on the Haunted Hill one. I had like, I had like sticker, I had the donut sticker that said, put your fingers in my hole. Um, <laughs> but that was really it. Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess but... Haunted Hill, I did the like, you could get a page of the original art folded up inside the book. <laughs> That's so cool. And so with this one, we have the sewing kit. <laughs> so you get, because, you know, because she's covered in stitching, I think that, you know, the monster on the go needs to have pre-threaded needles on her at all times. So you can buy a real emergency sewing kit that comes with a QR code with, uh, like, for an instant download of the comic. So you can read it on your phone wherever you are while you're stitching yourself back together. That is so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think these are like. Oh, so this is this is one of the variant covers. Yeah, if you scroll down in the main campaign, there's much bigger images of the variant covers. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, there's there's like Laura Helsby. They did this. Um, I, I reached out to them really early on because I was like, they kind of. I didn't want to draw a cover. I wanted you know once I decided to do the the uh, sculpture, um, and I thought like they do a sort of uh, a style that is like I think similar to mine honestly in terms of drawing um it's 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 inky and it's a little bit abstracted and it's a like it's a little bit like uh it's got like a grit to it you know it's yeah. got a kind of cool like crunchy vibe and um they also are always posting on on on, on twitter.com about like tapes they've bought or like old discmans or walkmans or like game consoles and just like cool boots and jeans with patches in them and just like all this like detailed shit and i was like yeah yeah um i think victoria's bedroom probably looks a lot like yours because one of the things <laughs> about victoria is that she is like she doesn't have any memories she's existed for three years she doesn't know where her body parts came from and she's always yeah. thinking like maybe i can maybe I can remember, like, maybe I can trigger something. So she is constantly buying things that she'll feel some, like she thinks that someone her age should feel nostalgia for. So like just little details, like in the first issue, you see that, um, uh, the, like the ashtray she gives to, um, Elizabeth is an old, like 1980s McDonald's ashtray, which is yeah. something that I've obviously bought myself from eBay. Um, and I, I said to Laura, like, can you do like something with like, like, can you can you do your your bedroom but for victoria and they did this fucking cool 
like high angle with just there's so many little cool Easter eggs in there and like action figures and records and game consoles. And uh, I, I, the original version wasn't set at night and I wanted to get the light on, on her from the screen. Um, and it's, 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 you can see it, but it's not as clear that it's like Mario Kart uh, paused on the TV screen and the oh. uh, restart is highlighted. So it's like, the, just this little subtle message that like Victoria is always giving herself the option to restart. Right. Yeah. So it's like just shit like that. And like, like posters from events she didn't go to. Yeah. Like everything yeah. is, is about like seeing who she can be from like who, who she like trying to figure out who she would have been. That's amazing. There's also, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Their, their style blends really well with your style as well. There's mm. there are a few perspective shots in in your book as well, you know, like where, yep. where you see the entire room and all the details around it, and this this cover definitely ties in very nicely with that. Thank um, you. Cool. And then the Steph C cover, which is just so fucking cool. Like it is so cool. Uh, I reached out to her uh, and like I, I I sent her the I sent her the issue and like we came up with kind of the basic concept together. Um, and she sent me a few sketches and I, you know, chose, chose the one that I thought was like working the best. And then the next day on twitter.com, I see she's posted some like process shots where she is, um, referencing the, the characters from death becomes her. And I had never mentioned death becomes her. I had never said anything about it to anyone. Yeah, and yeah. like the dynamic between the two women in that film has been like an inspiration for so many things that I've written. Yeah, it's one of my yeah. favorite films. Um, my ex and I went as them for Halloween one year where I actually wore the red dress and got two iPads, cut a big circular hole in the front and back of the dress and put the iPads in it uh, on FaceTime with each other so you could see right through me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was just like, oh, she read my comic and she immediately got it. And that, that yeah. felt incredible. Um, and just this kind of like, this is, you know, this is the closest to a traditional Frankenstein, uh, story that like the book ever gets. Like it, it, it really yeah. feels like classic horror, like, you know, real physical body horror happening right there in front of you. It's, it's just so great. Yeah. It also reminds me of this, uh, this eight movie from eight, the eighties, reanimator a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it goes it goes with the theme of uh, reanimation as well, right? Like creating a human being. And, um, One of the things I really wanted to do with this book was um, never have it be, uh, never have it be like. When I modernized it, I didn't want to make it more realistic. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's I don't think it's that interesting to be like. And by the way, here's how it would really work. I'm like, oh, fuck off! It works the way they said it worked in the book. Like, <laughs> yeah. She was brought to life by lightning. That's it. Like they put a bunch of lightning in her and she's stitched together from other body parts. I don't know what else to tell you. That's how light that's the that, fuck it. That's my reality. And so when you see her like in this first issue, um, one of the pages in the, in the campaign, but there's another page later where she's like, she's picking at her stitching, like this kind of an anxiety thing going on. And she's just pulling at the stitches with her fingernails. Yeah. And you actually yeah. see her like pry a piece of her arm apart and there's no blood. Yeah. It's just green all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like that kind of. I like to acknowledge yeah. that, like, fuck off. It's a story. It's yeah, exactly, exactly. I think mean, that's that's the point. Like, you created the world, you make the rules, uh, hmm. and obviously, you're play here. You're already basing it on a on a, on an existing property, but you can play by your own rules, right? Like, like. Well, I'm I'm just right? I'm playing by Mary Shelley's rules. Yeah. I'm, I'm like I'm not even I'm not gonna I don't like it when people are like well we have to make sure that this thing is still plausible we're updating the story so let's talk science yeah. no this yeah. is a story about characters and human emotions and the complexities of who we are as people and what we represent to each other and whether we're misinterpreting that and there's some cool body horror in there it's a it's, it's a it's a French film disguised as genre fiction yeah yeah no and and it's also I mean comics can go in ridiculous places so who cares mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly it, it's it's a perfect who cares thing <laughs> yeah. so yeah uh any any other like uh, obviously you don't need to uh, spoil them but do you have any like other reveals based on stretch goals uh, for for 
now? Like, do you have any other plans? Um, I don't. I like. Look, you know the this campaign. I'll be honest, has been like more difficult than previous ones. Um, uh, it's my first. I, I've I moved back to LA yesterday, um, which has been a complicated mess, and my suitcase is missing. By the way, my okay. Do you think this sounds reasonable? I had a three hour flight from Vancouver to LA and it turned out to be a 19 hour trip because 20 minutes into the first flight, they're like, we have to make an emergency landing in Seattle. I'm like, okay, whatever. So we do this an hour later, we deplane and they announced to us that the plane is fine, but the pilots have been deemed unfit to fly. <laughs> what? And then they rebook me on a thing like 10 PM. I fly to San Francisco. They put me in a hotel with meal vouchers, but the restaurant is closed. I have to be back at the airport by 6 a.m. or by, by 5 a.m. for a 6 a.m. flight to L.A. I get to L.A. and they're like, yeah, we don't know where your suitcase is. We'll call you when we find it. So oh yesterday they call me at 10 in the morning and they're like, okay, we've got your suitcase. We're putting it in a courier at 1030. It should be there within the hour. They send me a tracking thing and a link to a website where I can put in a number and whatever. I go to the website. It says that it, like all it says is um, we'll be picked up at 10 a.m. It's now 1030, but we'll be picked up at 10 a.m. and we'll arrive by 630 today. And then it says in bold letters, any package arriving, any suitcase arriving at a residential location after 11 p.m. will be delayed until the following day. Great. Okay. Cool. I'm yeah. stuck here all day. I can't go anywhere. I got to wait for my suitcase to show up. The place I'm living has like a crazy amount of locked gates and things. Cause it's like, you know, the kind of neighborhood I choose. Um, 11, 11 PM comes and goes. I'm like, cool. I guess the suitcase isn't showing up. I go to bed cause I have to be up early. Cause I'm doing, I did a con today. 2 AM. My phone starts ringing. I answer and the guy says, yeah, I got your luggage. I'm like, okay. And I said, are you downstairs? And he just hangs up on me. So I put what? my shoes up, put my pants on, put my shoes on. I go down, I unlock the door, I unlock the gates, I go out to the street. I see this like truck, this courier truck driving away. I, I, it was like maybe 45 seconds and he was driving oh, yeah. away. And so uh, there's a number for me to call. It says like my, my suitcase is being transported, transported to a secure location at the airport. So I call this number and they're like, um, the, 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 the number I call goes to nowhere. It just, it just says like no such number. So I call the airline and they say, they conference me in with the company and the company's like, yeah, we're a 24 hour delivery service. Why would you think we wouldn't deliver it then? I'm like, because it says on your website that you won't. And they're like, well, that's not how we operate. Like, why do you write on your website? <laughs> and so now I have to make this choice of like, do I, it, it's it's about 70 bucks to go. I, I don't drive. So like 70 bucks each way in an Uber to go and get my suitcase. Now, yeah. I brought with me a suitcase with a smaller suitcase inside it because I've got a convention in Baltimore next weekend and I needed luggage to get all my books there. Inside the smaller suitcase is a very large Danny DeVito action figure and three dildos. And by the way, life hack, always put dildos in your checked luggage. The bigger, the better. Um, because when they, when they x-ray it, if they see dildos, they're going to be like, I'm not searching that. I don't want to touch those. You can, you can smuggle and like, like, you know, when people are like, you can, if you, you can hide radioactive material inside bananas, it's true, but you could probably just yeah. put it into a fucking dildo and you'd be fine. <laughs> um, but so, so like I have to choose, like, do I, do I just like buy new suitcases? I can live without a Danny DeVito action figure, I guess. I'm doing a new book called I'm only drawing Danny DeVito as the penguin until I stop wanting to fuck him. Uh, so I kind of like, like him around for inspiration. Um, but I don't know. Anyway, that's irrelevant. So this campaign, <laughs> that was a fucking tangent, wasn't it? <laughs> like, yeah, look, this campaign is weird because it's my first one in American dollars. And I normally do big ass books of like 144 pages and now I'm doing a single issue. So the amount per pledge is so much lower. I've got more people pledging, but like I'm making the money a lot slower. I had a whole plan where I was like, I look, I have a plan. If we hit the goal, if we get to 3000, I wanted to have a stretch goal of at 3,500. Uh, there's a thing called the grave diggers club, 
where every backer would get sent a fridge magnet with a body part on it. And over the course of this and several other people's Frankenstein campaigns, because there's a lot of Frankenstein books out there, you would be able to like continue your checklist of body parts in the Gravediggers Club. And a bunch of different creators would be having like different artists do interpretations on like organs and bones and muscles and just bits and pieces. So you can get like a sick as fuck collection of fridge magnets. But That's amazing. I don't know if we're going to get there this time. I get nervous. I'm a neurotic person. So I may save that for next time around. But, you know, if we suddenly, if it suddenly blows up, I will say stretch goal, Grave Driggers Club, <laughs> get on it. Get your, get your cool. Th I've designed the magnet. My first one's an eyeball because, you know, I've got funny eyes. I should do an eyeball first. Nice. Nice. I would expect nothing less than that. An eyeball or, or a penis. I think it, <laughs> and, and we, we get at least those two from you. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's in the, um, in the issue, you've read it. There's a whole discussion about how Victor... <laughs> Victor got every piece he needed to make the monster in like a week. And then he spent months digging up different graves to try and find the perfect penis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I initially, in the original version of this, I was going to have uh, cutaways to like Victor doing his shit and like kind of retell the Frankenstein story. And I, I didn't, I didn't go that direction and I'm glad I didn't. But yeah. one of the things was going to be Victor would be walking through a graveyard and like you would see the grave he dug up to get the perfect penis. And I was like, I'm going to make that a reward. Like, fuck everyone who's like, get drawn into my comic. I'm going to be like, buy this tombstone. Like $12,000 and canonically you will have the world's best dick. World's That's coolest amazing. dick is owned by <laughs> name on this tombstone. That is amazing. But um, I didn't end up doing the cutaway thing. And so I'm like, well, I probably missed out on infinite money. <laughs> I am pretty sure one of the backers would have easily <laughs> paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I um when I put out uh when I put out Haunted Hill, um, you know, it's a it's a book where everyone sucks, you know. Like that book rules, yeah. I love it, but like everyone in it is sort of a terrible person in some way. Because that's the fun, is like seeing shitty people like try their best, but be like even when you're right, you're unbearable. Uh, and I had this idea of like, no one, like everyone wants to be in comics. No one wants to be in Haunted Hill. Cause you know, if you're going to show up in Haunted Hill it's because you've done something shitty. Like everyone who's in that book is cause they've done something shitty e except Eva who fucking rules and is like one of my favorite people. And is like, I named her after a real person who I didn't know very well. And now over time, that real person has become more and more like the character, which is fucking fantastic to me. Uh, it makes me feel like an actual God, but, um, uh, I was going to do a thing of like, for for like ten dollars extra, you can get a certificate guaranteeing that I will never draw you into Haunted Hill. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I mean, look, Volume Two is coming next year. Maybe I'll do it then. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally worth doing that. I think I think that that's definitely good for Volume Two because people have read Volume One. They know what yeah. to expect. This is this yeah. is the thing. I always get too far ahead of myself. I'm like. Let's just do this as if everyone's already read Because I'm so used to doing conventions where people can be like, I'm going to pick up the book and read it in front of you like a dick. And if I like it, I'll buy it. Or I'll go, hey, this is good. Good luck with everything and walk away. But like on a Kickstarter, like no one's read the book. They don't know what they're, they're getting into. That's very true. That's very true. Oh, man. You, you don't even know how many Kickstarter books are pending for me. Like I, I, I have at least at least 50 books that I have to stick, still get through. I so um I have uh like I don't I don't I, I don't rely on natural light for drawing so I keep there's windows on one side of my office and then like about I don't know 12 feet back from that there's all my desks so there's no the sunlight never reaches my desks and I have all of my like, a lot of lamps I'm a crazy lamp person um and they're all on different arms that swing in from different places and all this sort of shit but I noticed that my office was feeling like much darker and I didn't, I kind of couldn't put together why. And I realized it was because I was stacking my Gemini mailers on the windows hill. And so all of like every Kickstarter book that I haven't even opened yet had literally yeah. covered one of my two windows. <laughs> that is so, 
and like I, I'm, I'm literally at the point now where I'm like, well, I, I was meant to read this one. I promised someone I'd read this one soon. Like I'm so I'm behind on everything. I have I have not had like a minute, and also because because I'm out of town so often, I will come back and like go to my my post office box, and they'll be like, yeah, here's 37 packages for you. Thanks wow. for inconveniencing us. I have this um. Wait, I have, a, I have a P.O. box. It's just a short walk from my office. And again, I don't drive. But I share this P.O. box with my best friend, who is a musician who orders a lot of keyboards. Okay. And every time I go there, the woman who runs the place, um, like, one, everyone, everyone is horrible to her. I'm always nice. But yeah. she's used to everyone being horrible to her. So every interaction begins with, her being very defensive and grumpy, and after, like, I'm friendly for 15 seconds, she becomes lovely. Uh, I really respect this energy, because, like, I like I, I think people who are working jobs they don't like get to be grumpy and get to be unpleasant yeah. to customers. Like, I want my waiter to be rude. Um, like, you know, growing up in New Zealand where we don't have tipping, uh, I always hated it when people were like polite to me when they were working a shitty job. I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry for buying food from you. Please just be mean, be grumpy. You can. Um, and now I can tip. So I'm like, I understand. I am paying for your kindness. I understand the system. There's a yeah. metric, you know, it's good. Um, but anyway, so like I, I went in there, I was like, Oh, just the stuff for me. And she was like, no, you have to take everything. I'm like, I'm on foot. I can't carry four keyboards. What am I like? You know, so now I can't go to my own PO box. Um, so I have to get my friend to like every time I'm like, look, you have to go. I will wait for you to need you to pick up a keyboard. <laughs> um, it's it's fine. And like, I, yeah. I, I want to I want to be clear. He's not an insane person. It's that he's working on like uh, he's working on it. He'll, he'll send and receive keyboards that do different sounds for different film scores. And he also works a lot on. Uh, toys that have musical stuff, so he's sending prototypes back and forth. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's big shit. But uh, it means that, like, that, like, my fear of her disapproving of me, of me being, like, a bad boy who's in trouble, means that I can never <laughs> get my stuff in any kind of timely fashion. So it's, like, even when I'm in town, it'll be like, hey, you have 11 things. Can you please pick them up? No, I can't. I'm too scared to. Yeah, yeah. You might have to carry ten keyboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or like, but even carrying ten books, it's, it's L.A. It's hot. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's a I half know. mile. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Again, I'm just I'm just going on these fucking wild tangents, um, it's but okay. yeah, it's 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 so funny. People will be like, "Please read my book." So I like put it into like this is this is the one that's urgent. It has to be read right now, and then I'll forget and like i'll get up at 3 a.m to jump on a flight i'm like oh i left that one at home i was gonna read that on a plane fuck yeah do you like do you get time to read or when do you read when when traveling or usually i i read on airplanes like (laughs) that's literally it yeah and like weird for me like i i don't i don't on airplanes i don't keep comics Mm. like my my whole mo is if i like i keep i keep trades i keep graphic novels only if i love them i don't want stuff i don't want to feel like i'm trapped by objects and i want more people to read stuff so i will take a pile of single issues no bags no boards fuck all that nonsense i just i want i want to read it and get rid of it so i read it and then i leave it in a public place so someone else can find it that's so amazing <laughs> i just i i just i mean i think like because you know like you know you and i met for coffee when i was in australia earlier this year you, i don't know if you noticed i was reading a comic when we arrived i left it there when we left oh i didn't notice that no and like I, I i will i will i think i'm gonna i'm gonna end up one day people are just gonna be like following me around because i never it's like i want to read this thing oh it's a very valuable expensive comic i don't give a shit i'll buy it I will crack open a fucking CGC if I want to read it. If I can't get it somewhere else, I'll, I'll always go for the easiest way to read it. But if the yeah. only way to get it, I have cracked open CGCs <laughs> to read the comic inside because yeah, I was like, yeah. "There's no other way to get this book. They never put it out in a trade. No one has it. Yeah. Fuck it." Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. read it, leave it somewhere. Like someone out there has picked up like probably, I don't know, like I think the most valuable book I ever left behind was I think $1,500. It was Whoa. like when, yeah. And I like, and I, I know they're like, it, it's stupid. I could, I could sell these things, but here's the thing. As soon as I start selling comics for their value, I yeah. start thinking about it in terms of like, <sighs> like how I, I could sell it myself. I could mm. sell it directly. I could do eBay. I would be miserable doing it. I would be obsessed with it the whole time, or I can sell it to a comic store and get half the value and yeah. they can on sell it, but then I'm going to be bitter about that. Like everything about it was making comics miserable for me. If yeah, I leave yeah. it on a bus, someone else gets to read it. And yeah. if they, if they don't know it's valuable and they destroy it or throw it away, it makes every other copy a little bit more valuable. So you're That's all true. welcome. That's true. That's that it also gives you a sense of like, I, I think it gives you a sense of detachment to things, right? Mm. Like you don't need to be attached to, to physical objects. Right. So <laughs> I was like, the one time I really cleaned up on comics though, was when something is killing the children came out, every mm. single person I knew saw that cover and went, I bet Richard would like this book. I wonder if he knows about it. And I got given 15 copies by different people. Oh, wow. <laughs> And like, I was like, oh yeah, I'll get around to reading that. And I just kind of like, I thought it was very funny. I, I, I always like multiple. So it's funny. I had this pile of the same book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I read it. I was like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. I like this book. And I was like, I should, I should, um, uh, I should, you know, get rid of these other copies. <laughs> and then I was talking to a friend of mine who, who like values comics for a local comic store. And he was like, yeah. He said, oh, you know, every now, every now and again, a book blows up. Like, have you seen this? Have you read something that's killing the children? I was like, yeah, I did read it. Why? It's like, oh, it's, it's like, it's like a thousand dollars a copy for issue one now. I was like, wow. You know what? If you give me 500 a copy, I will give you every copy I have. Like, please, please give me seven and a half thousand dollars. Like, I don't want to know anything else about it. I will walk away. I just like, that will pay for the printing of the next two books and their rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. But by the way, it made me feel gross. You know, <laughs> I'm 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 bad at money. I mean, you it's legit. You did you didn't you didn't you didn't do anything wrong with it. You know, it's 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 a legitimate well, thing that you did. There's also like this. I have this weird hang up where um, I think that like everything is right for someone right like like the the books i hate the movies i hate someone else likes and yeah. um it's gonna hit different for them i i don't give a shit about I like i hate outer space anything said in outer space fuck off i don't, I don't want to read that i think it's garbage i'll always think it's garbage forever and always but other people like outer space so fine yeah. they can have their thing what i don't like is when someone gets something that isn't for them and then says this thing is bad as opposed to, I don't like this thing. Those are very yeah, different statements, you know? Very different things. Um, and it's, it's why, like, when I don't like something, I try not to talk about it. I saw, I've seen some movies recently I really disliked. I thought they were very bad. Yeah. Um, it's rare that I think something is, like, objectively bad. I did, you know, I, I, I did say that um, I, uh, I, I, I posted on Twitter.com that I'd seen The Last Voyage of the Demeter. And I said, yeah. I am posting this here so that I can remember that I actually saw it because I've already forgotten what happens. <laughs> like, that's kind of as close as I will get. Like, I'm, I'm never going to be a person who's going to be like, here's my fucking think piece on why X movie sucks. Um, yeah. Because it's just not for me. Um, yeah. Last Voyage of the Demeter was for me. Like, that's a fucking film about one chapter of Dracula expanded yeah. to an hour and a half. That's fucking for me. That's my yeah. film. God damn it. Yeah. Like, like, I am the CEO of that movie. Yeah. Um, and it, it was so forgettable. So like in, yeah. in that case, I feel okay about it, but like, you know, whatever people do the same. Um, and I remember I was at a, uh, at a Kmart and somebody, uh, was looking through like the, this, this is back in the DVD days, the, the heydays of wonderful DVDs. And they were looking through like the clearance bin and there were like 12 copies of the wild bunch and like the director's cut I mean the sort of semi restored director's cut of the wild bunch that movie fucking rules um yeah. the other day by the way i heard someone say that, that something honks 
and I want that to catch on as slang. Like I'm like I don't like young people <laughs> slang a lot of the time, but like that thing yeah. honks fucking rules. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, the wild bunch honks. Um, it's like and it's, but it's like two ninety nine, and these people are looking through things and they go, oh, well this one's cheap, and I look over at them and I'm like, you're not gonna like the wild bunch. And I love the wild bunch. Yeah, and you're yeah. gonna watch the wild bunch and you're, you're you're gonna go home tonight and be like this was cheaper than renting a movie and you're gonna watch and you're gonna say i don't like this this is hard yeah, um yeah. and then you're gonna tell people that the wild bunch is a bad movie and i don't want that to happen so i just walked over to them and i was like hi you're not gonna like this movie uh can i buy it instead and they're like well there are other copies i was like no, no i'm my intention right now is i'm gonna buy every single copy <laughs> and i'm gonna only give it to people who i think will enjoy it yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Because recommendations matter. You give things to people that you think you know will will appreciate the thing. And I know that makes me sound like an insane person, and that's <laughs> that's fine, that's reasonable. But like for the, for for thirty six dollars, I got twelve copies of the Wild Bunch. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and every and single like, person, you know, every single yeah. person who got it was like, "I love this movie. What a great movie, Richard! I would never have seen this." Like, yeah, there you go. Fucking trust me. Exactly, and like you said correctly, every art is subjective. You know, yeah. It, 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 yeah, I I really don't like when people just say like, "Oh, I hate this thing; it's bad," or you know, things like that. I you like that's that's definitely not the vibe for me. Like, yeah, I I, I like to say it's not for me. Right? It's for, yeah, that's it's as simple as that. Yeah. And like, here's the thing: every now and again, there's something that isn't for me that honks. <laughs> See how casually I use yeah. it now. Um, I'm I'm so young and hip. I am. Since we last spoke, I have turned thirty-eight years old. I am now the same age as Homer Simpson. You're still young, one year younger than me. Yeah, you are now older than Homer Simpson. For the rest of your life, you will be aging, and Homer Simpson won't. Like Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused. That's the thing I like about Homer Simpson. I get older, and he stays the same age. Like. We are now trapped in a post Homer Simpson world. You are, I don't know how old Herb, his brother, is, but like you're on your way to Abe, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's rough. Well, we are, all, we are all going to get there at some point, you know? <laughs> hey, not everyone. <laughs> you gotta think positive. Uh, <laughs> That's, true. That's true. But you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, yeah, these th these things will come along where you're like, oh, that was cool. Like, yeah. I watched The Flash this week. Yeah, that movie honks. <laughs> yes, it I, does. I, I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it yet, but I, I it's, have to. It's so weird. Yeah, it's so like it is swinging for the it, like it's the kind of movie where you're like, like it feels like they don't know what a superhero movie is yet and they're just trying cool shit and that fucking rules oh i like, love those kind of movies <laughs> everything's so formulaic nowadays this feels yeah. like they're swinging for the fences ezra miller is obviously a problematic figure yep but yep. they also rule they're yeah. an awesome actor like mm. like perks of being a wallflower we need to talk about kevin these movies are great and their performance is great in all of them. Um, they are very good as both versions of Barry Allen. There is two very interesting things in this film. One of them does pretty heavily rely on what if a lady died? Um, but it's the conceit that Barry Allen is a much worse person if his mother doesn't die because he hasn't faced anything serious and he's grown up to be kind of a shitbag yeah yeah that's an interesting conceit and it, they the way they explore it is quite cool mm. again it does rely on what if a lady died but <laughs> yeah moving yeah. like looking past that the the choices they make beyond that are, i think are good the second nice. part is that most films follow the very standard hero's journey narrative the Flash follows a mentor's journey. This is about Barry Allen being a mentor to himself and to Batman. And that fucking rules. Nice. I love a mentor's journey. It's so rare to see. Yeah. I am like, like, like this is the bit that Joseph Campbell never cracked. And that's <laughs> so exciting to me. Nice. Also, nice. it's just a weird ass film. 
Yeah, I am always excited for weird movies. To be honest, you know, like they, something that's not seen before. Mm. Like I, I just, I just want to see new things. You know, like it's, it's. I'm, I'm totally done with things that are like they're not for me. You know, th- things that are mm. you know already done before, or maybe like just standard run of the mill stuff. Maybe every now and then on uh, on a on a Friday night when I'm gorging on cake, I, I might just watch a cheesy movie that that just uh, you know takes me through that night. But you know, uh, most of the time, I do want something weird and new. <laughs> so, now, yeah. now, when when you're when you're gorging on cake, I, I like I gotta tell you, okay, here is a thing that I have never done, but I've always wanted to. Okay, yeah, and this was okay. I'm gonna, there's two things. One is there's an episode of Boy Meets World where, uh, uh, fuck, Will F- Will Friedel's character Eric, I think, um, is mm. eating like from a giant ass like salad bowl. He pours an entire box of cereal and an entire carton of milk in there and just sits there watching daytime TV eating it because he's depressed. And I was like, that looks like a dream. What an amazing <laughs> life! I want to do that. The other one is. This woman I used to work with, the same woman who once said to me when I asked her what she thought about the moon landing, said, I'm going to let me put it this way, Richard. If they did land on the moon, it wasn't on purpose, <laughs> which mind blowing concept. Um, she was amazing, but she had Friday afternoons off. This yeah. is back in my like early 20s when I worked at a high school. And uh, she said, I'll tell you what I do on Friday afternoons, Richard. I get a big Pyrex jug and I get four packets of Tim Tams and I pour them in and then I pour in an entire bottle of, bottle of Baileys and then I mash it up and I eat it with a spoon sitting on my kitchen floor hidden behind the counter in case my husband comes home early and I was like that's that is- so powerful yeah yeah I, I totally agree <laughs> just like there's is is it's not like she's this this is before smartphones. It's, she's not in there watching something. Her entire entertainment is I'm sitting on the kitchen floor with a big spoon and a jug full of mush. You know, you know the, what the feeling is. You're like, I'm doing this. I own this, and that's it. Like yeah. I, I'm I'm myself sitting here. I, I don't have anything to worry about. Even if I die right next moment, I'm happy. <laughs> Me- meanwhile, like I am, I am so overworked that I have. I, I used to give myself twelve minutes a day to watch television while I ate breakfast, and now I, I don't have time to get my steps in, so I have to pace back and forth in my hallway while I eat breakfast to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, man! You 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 need to find time. You need to find time to do this. You know, just no just life is finite. There. I need to get books finished. I want to have three hundred books by the time I'm forty. I mean, maybe that's your serial. Maybe that's your that's your Tim Tam and Bailey smash. You know, it's, it's just oh, making no. comics. It's just making comics. Yeah. yeah. I by the way, this this is book two hundred and seventy five. Just for the record, <laughs> you're pretty close. I'm, but like I've got a year and a half to do yeah. another twenty five books. That's oh this, my God. like this has been a fourteen book year for me, and that's been pretty tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, are you going to just finish your like uh, the last stretch by creating a lot of issues of Blastosaurus? Okay, so here's the thing: <sighs> Blastosaurus might be coming back again. Someone wants like since we last spoke, I have a TV show now. You know, oh, wow. um, it's in production. It's happening. Black Sand Beach is uh, an animated series. It's very exciting. Yeah. I am an associate producer. It's cool. Um, I am in talks with someone to develop a Blastosaurus animated series as well, and it's mm-hmm. suddenly made me go. You know, I've never done Blastosaurus the way I wanted to. It's always been with, like, either my very shitty co-writer on the original version pushing for a lot of stuff that I hated, or it has been for a company who really wanted to, like, center the kids as the main characters, which I was never really interested in doing. You know, like, my version of Blastosaurus is the stuff where it's like, Blastosaurus doesn't know how to make a good cup of tea. Blastosaurus eats too much ham and feels sad. 
Like yeah. this is the this is the shit that I like. And this week, for the fucking first time in the seventeen years I've been making that book, I was like, I know how to make Blastosaurus work now. Yeah. And I spent all day today at Long Beach Comic Con and it was a, a fairly quiet day. So there was a lot of time between people walking by and I got talking with an old editor of mine, um, the, an old editor of mine, like, like from the distant past, from the book that came out three weeks ago, the editor on the book that came out three weeks ago, Four Color Heroes from Fanbase Press, it's about two yeah. boys who fall in love through comic books. One of them isn't allowed to read them, so the other boy describes them to him and he imagines them. It fucking is beautiful and magical and very sweet. It'll make you cry. Um, you should all buy it. You never see the real superhero comics, only how Oscar imagines them to look. So you get them retold by an excitable 15-year-old. And every month as their lives pull them further apart, they get have a reason to come back together and talk about superheroes because they can't talk about the real shit going on. Bucking Masterpiece, 170 pages. Go buy it. Anyway, fourcolorheroes.com. Um, my editor from that, uh, I sp spend the whole day speaking with her, and I'm like, Blastosaurus might kind of honk, though. Um, see, it, it's so casual. Like, you don't even notice it anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I Like, I could make this book really work. I could make this fucking amazing, perfect, beautiful version of Blastosaurus, and then when I have this meeting, which is like in two months from now because I'm traveling too much and can't commit to anything. What if I showed up to them and he was like, by the way, I have entirely reworked this thing. Here's 19 more issues or whatever. I don't fucking know. And now it hurts I... louder. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it, the, the problem with last source has always been, he is either the only mutant and he's the weirdest thing in town, meaning yeah. that nothing else, like there's no one who can really challenge him, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you have a very boring standard, like secret crime fighter story, which I am sick of, or yeah. Blastosaurus is one of many impossible things that exist. And uh, then why the fuck is he the main character? There's he, like a, a dinosaur who talks is not more interesting than a man with a giant hand for a face. You know, yeah, yeah, um, and so it sort of just like stops making sense. And both of these things have consistently worked for about fifteen issues each, and they just kind of run into like, "Hey, there's my own butthole. I fell into it," <laughs> um, because the story sort of falls apart. And then I had yeah. this fucking revelation: mm. Blastosaurus is not the only weird thing. He lives in a whole world where weird shit is possible all the time, and he is retired. He is yeah. someone who has a massive backstory who has done a bunch of cool shit, interdimensional wars, crime fighting, detective work, monster hunting, whatever. But now he is just the weirdest guy on your block. Like, mm. he is a local celebrity. He is the guy people go to when they need stuff fixed. He fills the role of being kind of a casual detective or a monster hunter or a ghost buster or a whatever you need him to be. And there's like limitless potential for adventures there with a yeah. really well like fleshed out world of strange locals and and bizarre newcomers. And I can play fucking fast and loose with old Blastosaurus lore. I can keep the um, laundromat that doesn't obey the laws of time and space, which I love so much. And he gets to be a low status character who is treated as low status by the rest of the world, but as high status by the people who live near him because they all know who he is. Yeah, and that could fucking rule. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll move. Like maybe I'll like get over this and go back to uh, you know the things I should be doing, like X Y Z Frankenstein. But today I'm thinking a lot about my fucking dinosaur. Awesome, awesome, uh, cool. All right, we we're coming to time, but uh, before we go, you, can you give another? quick pitch of the book so that people list listeners can go and sure this. thing all right this is the ex-wives of frankenstein it is about uh elizabeth frankenstein and the bride of the monster on the day they find out that their husbands are alive and have been living secretly as a gay couple in the arctic circle and are returning to the city as heroes of the online queer community reddit and the mra movement it is about women uh being thrown back into chaos they thought was behind them it is about the 
complexities of a difficult friendship where you really want to like someone, but society has pitted you against each other. That's amazing. And it, it's, uh, it's both heartwarming. Uh, it's, there are a co couple of moments that are a bit uncomfortable where it does make you uncomfortable, but it's very heartwarming. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's all of that. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of emotions packed in a book. Um, yeah. Thank you for being on the show. It is actually just like you that you have, you are a lot of, a lot of emotions, you know? So <laughs> Listen, like, I don't know, I, I I keep making, like, Octopus made someone leave their husband. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> like, Haunted Hill, um, like, uh, no, actually, I can't tell that person's story. Haunted Hill made a couple of people do some pretty fucking wild things. I'm not going to say what they are, because uh, they're criminal activities, but they were inspired by my book, and that feels very good to me. Um, four color heroes made someone like fall apart on the floor of Comic Con because they recognized me from my photo in the back of it. Like I've had books affect people before, but like this year, I've just I don't, I'm a little overwhelmed by it. And um, X Wives of Frankenstein has been it's been it's it's been bringing about a lot of like tears and good feelings and it is all kinds of stuff and like some some stuff that was like. I really wanted to address and some stuff that I didn't even realize I was accidentally addressing. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hitting people, right? It is actually a very, it's like comfort food, you know, you, 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 went, you like, it gives you a very warm feeling at the end. Um, and that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, this is the thing. I like stories about people who are trying to be friends. Mm. Like no matter what these two are, trying to stay in each other's lives yeah no matter how bad it gets and that effort really matters yeah it, it almost feels like these two these two women like they they kind of feel both helpless as well as they, they feel helpless because they feel like uh they don't have anyone else to go to uh and mm -hmm. they are in that situation together and then at the end of it it feels like they are like they're sort of coming together, you know. So they 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 know that they are there for each other, you know. So mm -hmm. it starts from the point where like they're completely like they're off and they feel like they're, they're they they don't have anyone else, and then they they realize they have each other. So yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's 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 beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So I I really it, it it really means a lot that people are relating to this book. You know, it's the first time I've done a book that is. Uh, other people's characters and I was like I wonder if this is a thing I can do and it feels like I can so it's good no I mean that's that's the beauty of good writing I mean you can make the characters your own and you're you're expanding on characters that uh like you know that they, they they were not expanded that much in in previous properties so that's that's quite a fresh take on the on an existing yeah. you know? I, I mean I think I think that like Elizabeth is a really she's a she's an interesting character in the novel. Like so there's a lot of stuff going on with her that is hinted at. There's a lot of stuff that's really clear. Um, and I wanted to play with all of that stuff very closely, but, but Victoria, um, in the novel, Victor makes the, a bride for the monster and then doesn't bring her to life. And he, he burns her, um, because he knows that, you know, he doesn't want to create another monster. And then in the film, the bride of Frankenstein, she's the fucking titular character and she exists for three minutes at the end of the film where all she does is scream and then gets blown up. And so like, it's, 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 she's nothing. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to really take that one and make her my own. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And in a way, that's a good thing, right? Like that That's like a clean slate that you're starting with. <laughs> yeah. And, and I got to do the, like, you know, I, I think that, that only a couple of people have kind of noticed it, but like, yes, the death becomes her thing is very real. Yes, the look of that is very real. Um, but there's also a very, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm being too subtle with it, but like, I mean, Elon Musk has two ex-wives and he sort of pretends to be an inventor too. And it's sort of weird how Victoria has that hairstyle that Grimes has. I don't, I don't know if that's like, 
a thing I might have done. Just, <laughs> I don't know if that's anything. I mean, I yeah. wish he'd done his rebranding sooner, and I could have just called it the X Wives. I could have the Twitter Wives Frank. You can still do that. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Always dead name of corporations. <laughs> <laughs> So many memes and jokes with that name. Oh my yeah. god! <laughs> I, 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 I'm yeah. Everyone was like, "He's building a super app," you know. So, which means you can do pretty much anything on it. I wonder, like, what he'll do when for the video app because it'll be called X Videos. <laughs> <laughs> you can do anything on it. Can you make your dad love you? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not to be mean to Elon. You know? Uh, we wouldn't dare. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for coming on the show. It's always it's always fun uh, having mm -hmm. you here, and uh, I'll I'll definitely wait for for the next one as well, uh, next issue, and back this issue as well. You know. So. Yes. Uh, by the way, next issue I think should launch in October. Oh, cool. Yeah, October you know, you know like, me. I'm fat. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, the Danny October DeVito book will like, be December. Then this will be January and March, I think. If they find your suitcase on time. And if like, well, no, look, <laughs> look. I can draw Danny DeVito from memory. I have 128 portraits of him that I've done in the past month and a half. I've watched Batman Returns 18 times. This book is going to be a deep fucking dive into my psychological problems and my attraction to Batman. <laughs> Yeah, it's when yeah. he's it's when he's eating the fish with his bare hands. <laughs> like, I don't I, I I I wish I could explain it, but like Yep, I was just like, yeah, I wanna fuck that guy. I could make everything better with my dick. Maybe if like I could show him unconditional love and make him feel attractive, he wouldn't try and steal all the babies in Gotham. <laughs> I would be a hero. We don't need Batman. We have Richard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Batman can go off and fuck Catwoman. We can get yeah. the Catwoman sequel we deserved, the the, yeah. the Daniel Waters one. Um we can have Two Face with the with the Taser face in, in that sequel because Batman will not be busy dealing with the penguin. Richard will be taking care of him, saying, I don't care if your weird Victorian pajamas are soiled, I still love you. I want to touch your sad face. I want to say like I will I will like Please don't bite my nose off. I'm just going to give you a little kiss on the forehead, buddy. And then we're going to make sweet, sweet love to each other. And you, I'm not even going to complain about the fish smell. It's yeah. fine. It's like, fine. I I can do that. I have put up with so much worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just... And, like, by the way, I want to be clear. I, I am very attracted to Danny DeVito normally. But the Penguin is designed to be the grossest character in the world. And... I'm mostly a bottom, and when I see Danny DeVito as the penguin, I'm like, I want to top that fucker. <laughs> I'm, I'm having to unpack a lot with this book. It's going to be good. Nice. Nice. I, like, yeah, I, I find I find your work endlessly interesting. Everything <laughs> from, like, from, <laughs> from Octopus to Ex-Wives of Frankenstein to Danny DeVito uh, yeah, to... Even like gorillas in our midst, you know. Oh, before we go, like I, I actually found uh, found a couple of articles about you in New Zealand Herald from like years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and when I read through those, I, it, it almost felt like the person who wrote those articles about you didn't exactly know what comics are. They Wait, were... was this um, <laughs> was this the article where there's a picture of me wearing sunglasses <laughs> indoors? <laughs> Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know I like one, how thin was I back then? Two, cool t shirt, dinosaurs I eating each other. You. Yeah. <laughs> um like I don't know what the f I was I was twenty two years old and the uh the like editor editor in chief at this comic company who had like option Blastosaurus call like an american company calls the new zealand herald and says i have a big hot scoop about one of your local boys who's making good in the big world yeah. and then did this like fucking interview where he told them that like i was moving to america 
and like Blastosaurus is going to be like a TV show and a video game series. And I'm like, obviously none of this ever happened. I didn't know this was going to, and the, the paper called me like, can we come and interview you? I was like, I sure, I guess. Um, they put like, they, they did my hair. They put me in the sunglasses. Like what the fuck? Was... And then like, they made like all, all these weird references to how I'm really into hair metal. Spoiler. <laughs> I'm not. It was, yeah. it was so bizarre. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing seems like, very off. <laughs> then, then, like, then, like the the article comes out. It turns out to be like this, like four page thing in the like weekend entertainment magazine. And suddenly, I get like angry calls from my family, being like, "Are you moving to America and didn't tell us?" I was like, "No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Like, I'm, I was trying to, but I was more because I was like dating an American and trying to like end his marriage and run away with him. But that obviously didn't work. Um, ah, <laughs> such is life. Um, but." Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was, yeah, that was a weird fucking, there's another article out there about me where I'm also wearing sunglasses because at that point I was like, it's very funny. They put me in sunglasses. I'm going to be in sunglasses in every picture because it's hilarious. Yeah. And it's yeah. me leaning over a shelf of my comics. <laughs> I've seen that one too. Oh, it's so, I think I'm wearing the same t-shirt. Yeah. God, it's, it's, it's like, it's so weird. There's a, um, there's a. Uh, TV. I, I don't. I don't know if it's still online, but there was like the t the TV news came and did a story on me, where like the the narration for it is like Richard Fairgrave describes himself as, as a comic artist with funny eyes that stick out in different directions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my god. Yep. But you know, like this is this is the thing. I I, I learned my lesson. I I can't do like every time I try and do family friendly normal content for the media, I end up fucking it up somehow, or it ends up being this weird like, who are you're not a per you don't know how people talk, do you? Like, what are yeah, you doing? Yeah. yeah. Because I'm I'm just, like sitting like like I'm going to behave like a person. I will need some <laughs> sugar water. Like, it's monstrous. And I get to come on things like this, like like now modern day Richard. I get to be like, hi, I'm I'm a sloppy fucking dirtbag. Let's talk about it. Of course, yeah. like the downside of this now is that everyone read Octopus and like Richard likes sex clubs and poppers. I'm gonna bring him poppers on the fucking convention floor and be like, you want to sniff some pop? Like, I don't want to get horny with you. I'm selling comics right now. Yeah, yeah. I don't bring like, <laughs> like bring me a bottle of poppers by all means. Leave them with me. Don't ask me to sniff them at my booth. You weirdos. <laughs> I don't need to know that your butthole is more gapable right now. I'm selling you a book. Yep. Ay, ay, ay. <sighs> See, I always end with an overshare. Look, I should go. I should drink some more, and you should go and have the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> no, the view, no, I don't know. The view are just having fun. Anyway, yeah. um, no, this is this uh, is this is great. Leave all of it in. Do not edit a fucking thing. I'm not going to. Good. That's the beauty of this interview. I'm not going to edit anything. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. All right. Do, do you do you have like an official sign off? I can't remember. No, I'm, my sign off is thank you for being on the show, and you know, um, always welcome back here. And do uh, going back, uh, do going back. X Y of Frankenstein on Kickstarter. Uh, it's on right now. Uh, make it happen. I want to see more of it. Thanks yes, it'll be there until September 21st. The website is kickrichard.com. Too easy. Too, Too easy, easy to remember. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>